great to be able to welcome students to stage and, uh, and get some student input. Here we are at a 21st century learning conference and it's all about learning and schools and it would be a bit disingenuous if we didn't have a few students to hear from. Yesterday we had a fantastic group, some of the same um, panels, panellists today were present on there and we had a little bit bigger representation of schools. Unfortunately we're a little bit dominated by, dominated by West Island School today. So. Yes, you're looking like uh, big winners, so I think they've intimidated, but we do have Seth here from also Hong Kong International School. So we'll start. We've got Seth, Seth Forrester from Hong Kong International School. Uh, Damien, uh, sorry, Damien, I've forgotten your surname. Damien Fung from West Island. Uh, we've got uh, Sai Sure again, from West Island. And we've got Patsy Ng from West Island and also Martin Lee Patterson. So I'm welcoming them to the stage. I'm very, very grateful for their presence and for the input that they're going to spread. Yesterday's panel was fantastic. We really dived quite deeply um, into uh, quite a few aspects of schooling and about online and health and well-being and all, all sorts of things. And it was quite wi wide ranging. And there was some great audience participation. And that's what I want to encourage again today. I've got a series of questions around another theme that we've got today. And the theme is um, just a very, very open-ended theme. You know, we're just talking about it being 2018. You've been talking about these amazing online apps that are available. We've got digital learners carrying th around things in our pockets. So when we get to the school environment, how much of what we've been talking about is actually embedded and what's actually happening and what's going on in there? Is it this great experience like we've been sharing about? Or are there things that the school is not doing that they should possibly be doing in 2018? That's what the topic's about today. So we're going to unpack that. But again, I've got a few guide or prompt questions, but by all means, feel free to pop a hand up. Uh, I don't know how the acoustics are going to go. We'll do the best to sort of hear. Uh, I, we don't have any roaming, roaming mics, but if you shout out nice and loud, we'll, we'll be able to take your question. But anyway, let's, let's just kick off and get underway. Um, yesterday, we, we kind of shared things around and I got everybody to start off with just a, a general kind of a comment. So I'm going to do the same. I'm going to start off with Seth and we'll just go around the panel and perhaps just get an indication of uh, what their day is like at the moment. That is, just for your benefit, I'm going to ask them to just describe what they take to school, what devices they're allowed to have at school, how that operates with them, roughly about how much of their day is spent online using some sort of a, a digital learning device. Um, and, you know, and also perhaps in that, just one thing that they feel could be happening that would be easy to take on board that isn't happening at the moment. So, Seth, do you want to kick us off along that topic? Sure. So, uh, hi, I'm Seth. I'm a senior at HKIS, the sole representative from HKIS. Uh, and as far as devices go, typically we are all required, well, actually not typically, we are all required to have a MacBook Air with us at school. Uh, it's part of our everyday usage. We use it in almost every single class for either looking at assignments, turning in assignments, writing assignments, what have you. And our other biggest device is TI Inspire Calculator. It's just your typical graphing uh, multifunction calculator. And if I were to say one thing about my school, just like to start off with, I think it talks a lot of talk without walking a lot of walk, which I might elaborate on, but later. Thank you. Damien. Um, so I would say that West Island is pretty much the same as well as HKIS, with the exception of the Macs, as we are allowed to use any laptop that we prefer after year nine. But before year nine, we have to use uh, the school provided HP laptops. And one thing potentially that uh, you feel, just, just a short snippet to get us started. Is there one burning thing that you think they should be doing that they're not doing? Uh, I feel that using HP laptops is not the best choice we can get for price to spec ratio. Okay. So. Um. I'm in year nine or grade eight, and I tech, like since I'm still in year nine, I use a HP laptop, and I think I use laptops for almost 30% of the day, but we also use our phones in school for taking pictures and uploading them onto our com into our computer. Yeah, um, Patsy? Yeah, for Wiz, I think we're allowed a maximum of two devices on our Wi-Fi network. After that, we can't connect. So it's really just our phones and our laptops that can be used at school. 
and Nan. Yeah, hey. Um, so, like, I mostly use my phone and computer like everyone else, and also a TI-84 graphing calculator. So, uh, yeah, that's basically it. I th uh, I used to use one of the school-provided HP laptops, but after a few issues with that computer, I've sort of transitioned onto a Microsoft Surface Pro. Okay. Well, so far, we've just got a bit of an overview, a bit of an introduction, so let's dive a little bit more deeply. And guys, feel free to not give the answers that your teachers want to hear. <laughs> just, just give us an open, honest kind of an answer. So it is 2018. We are there. Let's kind of throw one in and, says, and, and say something like, in this day and age, should schools completely be blended? Should you have the choice, if it's open to you, to be able to turn up or not turn up, as the case may be, to be able to access the recorded video, to sit in there virtually and to do it that way? What would that be like? That work for you? What do you reckon, Seth? I vote yes. You vote yes? Very heavily yes. Yeah, yeah you'd like that kind so, of... Um, this is inspired by two things. One, over the summer I visited Worcester Polytechnic Institute, um, pretty good STEM-based university in, uh, in Massachusetts that uh, does that. They have vi every single lecture videotaped and uploaded online for their students to view. And when I was comparing that to my own experience in classes, I think that's amazing because uh, I typically will have three or four 80-minute periods a day, and about 70 to 80 percent of that is just worthless to me. Because based around the kind of le learner I am, which is very independent, very visual words focused or experiential, like I need to try something myself in order for it to work, listening to my teachers talk to me doesn't do anything. I don't get any benefit out of that. And so, um, and I actually proposed this to our vice principal last year, but uh, the, the idea of being able to videotape classes and upload them for students and then have optional attendance is something that would really enable certain types of learners to achieve something much better. Anybody else want to weigh in on that one? Yep. About the optional attendance, I actually read this somewhere. Um, one of the schools in America, like primary school, um, going to school is completely optional. And in the first three weeks, students played around, didn't do much work. And then finally, they actually started to enjoy learning and want to learn. So. In a way, it's actually a pretty good idea. Um, about the videotaping your lessons idea, um, we've kind of discussed this at school before, and I think some of the teachers might be wary about that because in the age of like social media, uh, even if you slip up once, then it's online forever, and I think they might be scared of being judged about that. For, for like Interesting. Interesting. Anything to add, Martin? Um, yeah, I think that videotaping lessons, uh, even if it's not paired with optional attendance, is a really good idea because don't you ever sometimes just really want to go back over a lesson because you didn't quite get it? Well, if there were if there were archives that were easily accessible of every single lesson, that would be so helpful, especially during revision time when you can just binge watch a few. Okay, I want to throw out another controversial one. Um, we have this really, really weird system that we've invented that uh, causes great stress. We, we basically shut down all lessons for a week and a half or a couple of weeks and we do this exam period and we don't do it necessarily when you're ready to learn. We do it at a time that we say we're ready to be assessed. We just do it at a time that's convenient for an exam calendar. What about if we did away with that, that thing? Would it work to just do online examinations that were taken securely when you're ready to do them rather than at a time of somebody else's choosing? Good idea. So I have an interesting perspective on that because HKS has recently, within my four years of high school, actually done that and gotten rid of our designated exam week where we all go sit in a room with 300 students and take the exam and then leave. Um, instead now, all of our, we're not technically supposed to have end of term assessments for the first semester. And uh, instead they're replaced with projects, presentations, you know, your other alternative forms of assessment. And from a student perspective, this has been bittersweet, but mostly bitter. On the good side, we no longer have the extreme stress of cramming for like eight exams within a one week period. But on the poor side, we are now swamped with huge projects and responsibilities over like a three to four week period for the entire month leading up to. And even sometimes I had a couple 
classes that spilled into my Christmas vacation, you're constantly working and you're constantly revising and you're constantly trying to make your projects better just to get that A. And I think it actually has had the adverse effect on our student um, community. It's added more stress rather than removing it. like a problem of how the projects are managed instead of uh, how it's how instead of what you're doing because like I think projects would reflect the real world more accurately than exams so wouldn't they be a better form of assessment anyways um. yeah. yeah you, you okay. can answer that one sir Go uh, I act no, I agree. I think projects probably are a better form of assessment, but I think when it comes to the question, do they remove stress? Not really. And then as far as management goes, I think at least, okay, so my experience this year has been that every teacher thinks that they're the one assigning the hard project and that the other teachers are the ones going to give a final test or back off a little bit. And so then you get, you know, six or seven different courses that are assigning you a three to four week project that's going to take up 20 or so hours of your time which when you say it, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it really compounds quite quickly, especially when you have to deal with um, formative assessments in school because we have weird assessment policies. So it, it just it becomes somewhat overwhelming when you have so many different things happening all at once rather than narrowing all of your assessment or regurgitating of learning into a short period of time. So I'm hearing that um the need to get some assessment and the need to get you guys to strive to produce quality and to hand something in that's quality and it's something that you're proud of is definitely putting some stress and some strain on you. Um, uh, in some senses, well, as a teacher myself, I'd like to think that's unintentional. So I want to ask you, and, it, and Seth, maybe we'll just get a comment from some of the others here as well, and just I, I really want to ask you whether uh, your school's generally you think are places that are really striving to provide a happy and uh, w w a place of well-being for you um, and you're finding it that way or, or whether you feel that, that school is probably not doing enough to provide a place that's, that's happy and supporting your well-being. Somebody from West Island want to just take that one first? Well uh, I'm actually like younger than you guys so then my, my idea of world problems are much more different than yours. So I kind of feel like our school really does um, take care of our well-being because we have a mixture of sports, arts, and academics. So I feel like our school, as of now, is doing a very good job. Okay. Another yeah. comment? Yeah, we also have these frequent well-being assemblies where the whole entire year goes into the sports hall and we rotate doing like meditation exercises. And I think some tutors also do like meditation mornings in okay. the registration. Okay. Martin, anything to add? Um, I don't think the school's doing as much with well-being as it could be. I think it could do a lot more. And I think that a lot of the kids sort of just when they hear the words well-being, they just sort of stop paying so much attention because it's like, oh, God, it's going to be meditation again, mindfulness. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, feel like if the, I feel like if the school could, fr could frame this sort of stuff in a more interesting way than just repeating the word mindfulness a lot, it, uh, it might be a bit more helpful. Okay, okay. Look, let's move on a little bit and, uh, and come to the old chestnut of, of homework. Uh, is homework something you're still burdened with or uh, have, has your school removed homework or should it remove homework? Seth. Okay. Um, so, again, this is a transition that's happened within my time in high school. I've kind of been part of the guinea pig class for a lot of changes. And um, so 10th grade year, they changed the homework policy. So now all of our homework is separated into formative grades, which don't count towards any sort of final grade or assessment at all. Instead, all homework is essentially optional. 
and merely serves as an opportunity for you to practice the skills discussed. So for instance, in a math course, you will just get like a worksheet that you don't have to do if you understand the concept, but will help you refine your skills to proficiency. I actually think this has been the correct choice. Like, um, I remember homework being tedious and boring a lot, especially earlier on in my high school career when everything was not as difficult. Um, but by making it optional, you allow the students who want to have that uh, opportunity to obtain proficiency and mastery the ability to do that while not burdening down the students who are kind of ahead of the curve a little bit. Uh, I believe that homework is very important for refining the skills of students. Um, and I believe that Ceph School, HKIS, is doing a good, good job with uh, their system. Uh, yeah, because homework, it can give stress to students who have a lot of coursework and uh, exams to do. But if they don't need the homework, they shouldn't do it. They shouldn't be forced to do it. And having an option is much better, better than having something fixed in stone. I agree with Damien and Seth. I feel like, um, well, right now, a lot of the work we do, we've been doing for the past years over and over again. So it's kind of um, up to a point when it's a bit boring because we've kept on learning about the same thing. And so then when we get homework, it's, it's like you're reinforcing it, but we already have reinforced it many times. So there's really no point. You don't, it's up to you. You can pass on if you want to. Um, yeah. But I'm going to basically echo what they've been saying. Like, ho homework as a non, like, as a thing that's optional sounds great because I think that could really help change the mindset around homework. So instead of something that you just have to slog through, it's, uh, it's changed, uh, it'll, it would be changed into something that you know is an option just in case you want to. Uh, in case you actually want to further your learning, which I think would be would be a better way to look at it for a lot of students. Okay, just hang on. To it. We'll go back. We'll, we'll go back that way in that direction. So, um, I guess again, schools have been in a bit of a trade-off because, as teachers and parents, we do want the best for students and we want the best outcomes. And sometimes, as teachers and parents, we can transmit that into kind of putting grade maximization ahead of possible, possibly student well-being. So I'd like you guys to comment on that. Uh, do you feel that the balance at your schools is more toward grade maximization, more towards student well-being? Um, and do you feel that there should be a bit of a change? What's your thoughts? Okay. Uh, I'm just going to jump into the deep end and say, I think student well-being should matter way more than grade maximization because, well, if the student uh, commits suicide, then there's really no point in which grade, and how good their grades are, so, yeah. Well, right now, it feels, kind of feels like a roller coaster of grade maximization and well-being because sometimes people are stressed, because either way you're still going to stress out, mostly because um, well-being, you um, have sports in that and as well as art, and as well as the arts, and people kind of stress out, oh, we need some people to do, um, to go to this sport, sports competition and not enough people are doing it. So it's kind of like the school is forcing us into well-being, which is something that we're not all that okay with. I actually think my school strikes a pretty good balance between this, because while we definitely do have a lot of rigorous coursework and stress, there's a there are numerous well-being programs and just changes that the school has made that have really contributed to kind of a more positive atmosphere. We have counselors that always are talking to people. We've got a mental well-being week. We've got weekly updates on you know personal health and well-being put in on our Schoology page. Uh, the change I made to homework and assessment I mentioned previously has helped alleviate a lot of stress despite the added projects. Um, and I just generally think that 
the emphasis on the behalf of the faculty body and the school has been really on encouraging development of students rather than making sure everyone's getting A's or fives on their exams. Um, I wasn't going to bring this up, but since Patsy has already mentioned suicide, I think uh, a large, a bit of a problem with the way that schools approach well-being is that it usually just comes in bursts whenever something happens, like, and it just feels more like the schools, uh, the schools overcompensating for something and trying to do something. Uh, and uh, kind of because they have to, uh, rather than because they actually care about student well-being. Like uh, yesterday, I saw uh, I saw a Reddit post which was li a link to a Wall Street Journal article, and it was about workplace suicide. And uh, the the sub the subtitle was, "How can you prevent this from affecting worker productivity?" <laughs> and I just think uh, I think more focus should uh, I think a lot of the I think it would be a lot better if the if the focus was on well-being all the time as opposed to short bursts when the school feels like it has to, you know? Hmm. Okay, some good thoughtful answers coming through there. Um, I have some more prompts, which I'm going to continue to go through, but if anything I've said so far has prompted a burning question amongst anybody out there who wants to just uh, chip in, by all means. Yes? Uh, you said that uh, sometimes you feel that you keep doing the same thing over and over again. Right? It was in the context of homework, but I assume it applies to the curriculum generally. What do you want to learn that you don't get to learn at school at the moment? OK. Well, uh, I think our years brought this up multiple times, but we have this class for, called Learning for Life, where you learn life skills, and I think uh, we had a vote last year, I think, for what we wanted to learn, and most of the year said we wanted to learn more stuff about basically how to adult and do like tax. So they added in these uh, uh, topics about writing resumes and stuff. So I think we'd like to learn how to adult. Yeah, I think a lot of the focus in school, like, do we really need to learn about like sex and drugs again in Learning for Life? and uh, so, yeah, like she said, I think l more life skills would be good because you know the you know that joke that's on the internet. Oh, I might not have learned how to do my taxes or f or how to buy a house in school, but at least I know the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a lot of uh, a lot of the things we learn in school really aren't practical. And I think we should be. Uh, I think we should be putting more focus into. Uh, I think we should be putting more focus into learning uh, how how all this stuff that we're learning applies in day to day life, not just L for L classes. Like Martin said, actually, schools in Japan they spend one hour every day cleaning the school, so they they don't actually have um, cleaning stuff in Jap Japanese schools, and they also learn how to cook and recycle. So they really they um I feel like in Japanese schools, actual life comes before education, which is really how life is right now, because if you don't if you have money but you don't know how to actually live life and what to do with that money, you, you won't actually have anything left, like whether it be money or other things like friends. <laughs> okay. Thanks for that. We'll, we'll, we'll keep pushing on. I'd like to paint a scenario. It's a scenario in which the school you attend has basically all resources digitized. Um, and you pick and choose what you want. Uh, you demonstrate knowledge at the end of it. Um, you have your own projects, you go your own way. A lot of what we've been hearing at this kind of a conference, um, it's, it's pretty well open to you to choose what you do, to choose your assessment, to demonstrate it your own way, and to move forward in the world. Is that a model that you feel that at 2018, at the stages you're at, you're ready for, or would that kind of open up a situation where 
you'd kind of say to yourself, I, I really don't know what I don't know. I don't know what I need to know. I'm going to be out there a little bit lost. Uh, and I don't think that this will prepare me for the kind of life I'm ready for. Anybody want to chip in and, and comment whether you're ready for that or not ready for that? Whether you want more structure, less structure, that kind of thing. Well, I actually have no idea right now, mostly because I'm in the middle of graduating and just have come to secondary school. So I kind of feel like, okay, I'm going to graduate in four years. Then what? What, what am I going to do? Go to university? Get a job? What's going to happen with my life? I don't know what to do. Um, I think it would be better if schools provided more uh, like more opportunities earlier on in the uh, school time to just like uh, maybe a couple of internships or check out a few jobs just to see what you're actually into, as opposed to get as opposed to doing those things after you've like d p done all your choosing and stuff uh, regarding your future and subjects you'll be taking. Uh, well, back to the original question. I feel that if we digitalize everything uh, in terms of school resources, that wouldn't be so practical because some things like some textbooks, it's better off having them as physical books. It's easier to take notes on science in a physical book than rather an ebook. Uh, I'm not sure if this applies to every school, but the ebook that we are providing for science in our school, it's not really useful. It's hard to navigate, it's hard to take notes on it, and it's not really user friendly, as some would say. I just, I just want to clarify before you go on. I, I, I know that the question that I asked was a little bit vague and a little bit nebulous. But what I'm saying is at the moment, generally your teachers have subject responsibility. So you're talking science. Your science teacher feels like that they have to be across content, guide you through that content, get you to an end point where an external assessment will be taken and you will come out. So that, that that comes back to that teacher to have a certain aspect of knowledge. What about instead if your teacher was more of a, a guide, a facilitator, a coach, and instead of doing science, well, instead of doing that level of science, you might have wanted to go and learn a little bit more about the science behind uh, battery technology, so lithium batteries, and go through there and do some sort of analysis like that with the idea of self-driving cars and bits and pieces. And you don't expect that the teacher has that information because the information is all on the internet anyway. And you're going to assess it, you're going to do whatever. So that's the kind of model I'm describing, where uh, uh, less that the teacher is the custodian of the knowledge and more that the teacher is, as I said, a coach or a guide or a facilitator on, facilitator on the side. That, that's what I'm trying to outline for you. So I think that the answer to if that's a good idea or not kind of splits, in my opinion. Because if I reflect upon myself as a freshman or sophomore and upon myself as a senior, like getting ready to graduate in a couple months, the answer is wildly different. I think when I was you know, 14, 15, 16, I didn't have the independence needed to be able to guide my own learning with or without a teacher guy helping me explore. I needed that set curriculum in order to figure out what I was going to do. On the opposite end, now that I'm like five months away from graduation and thinking about my future, the set curriculum is restricting and boring and like I'm basically checking out of all my schoolwork because, you know, I'm looking towards jobs and university, right? And so I think if there was some way to more split the process in high school or develop like older curriculums different from younger curriculums I don't know I'm not an educator but I mean that's kind of how I feel there needs to be a divide there interesting I mean we live in Hong Kong there's seven million people here and a lot of them are students so we c and Hong Kong isn't that big either so we don't have much space so we can't really cater to everybody because that just won't work out M some people want to learn this some people want to learn that we're gonna I think teachers are trying to teach you what's um, more widely appreciated more easier to um, help for everybody so it it doesn't work out if you're going to make everything cater to one kind of person. You have to cater to everybody because we don't have much space here in, in Hong Kong. We don't have many, much, we don't have like 
50% of the Hong Kong population isn't just teachers and the other 50 students. So we can't really cater to everybody. We have to just cater to everybody at once. Um, going back to uh, the question, I think most teachers can be guides, but I think mainly only if the students ask the right questions. So, but I think the thing holding some students back from asking questions apart from shyness might be uh, asking the teacher individual questions might take up a lot of the teacher's time. And I think some students don't think that would be fair to the teacher because that's just asking them for like a lot of effort. Um, I think now with like the the level of digitalization of um, of learning, I think we don't we don't need to be so bound to stuff like finding space on the timetable to run certain classes and stuff, uh, having to teach everyone the same things at certain times and stuff. I think there's a bit more flexibility so that maybe student maybe a compromise between that sort of structure and uh, figuring out how you want to learn yourself. Maybe there could be a bunch of options for ways you want to learn a certain subject, like maybe you want to focus on a certain area of science, so you can block, uh, so you can block out maybe a half term to focus on that before doing something else. I think that would be a good balance to get the structure needed while also having a bit of freedom. Hmm. Some interesting thoughts. Again, I'm just from time to time. Going to go back to the audience to see if this is anything that we've we've covered so far has piqued any sort of burning questions out there, and whether you'd like to go deeper on something. Yeah, lady here. Um, so when you answer this question, I, I actually want you to think about maybe your classmates and not yourself, because I can tell that you're all extremely motivated. Um, and Well, I think if a student's not if a student's not got the motivation to uh, to sort of check in and watch a few videos, then maybe they're not necessarily uh, then maybe they're not necessarily being as productive in class either. Uh, I think you can't really force somebody to pay attention if you know what I mean. So uh, I think a lot of the role of a school should be to sort of give them uh, to provide the motivation for the kids to sort of want to take the learning into their own hands as a, uh, and that would be, yeah, re really helpful. Adding on to what Martin said, I agree, because you can't force someone into doing something they don't want to do. That's not how people want to live life. You, you can just give them a little push, but if they're be still, they still don't want to do it, then they, it's probably something they don't want to do at all. So um, it may be, because the thing about school is a lot of the subjects are compulsory, so, and as well as some subjects are less important than others, such as art and technology is for some reason, I have no idea why, as I am a firm believer that art is amazing, is it's kind of looked down on, especially in the older years and when, when you have IB, because then you, you have to choose between all your arts and all your technologies in one, in one thing. Like, 
you have to pick between so many different arts, like art, drama, music, and technologies, like computer science and engineering, and just pick one from all of them. Like, some people want to do something that's more in the art world and not the science world, but you can't choose to not do math or English. Why? I don't, th so, I'm not quite sure how to answer it. I don't think that the solution to students paying attention in class versus you know them being motivated to watch the videos on their own is a problem that can be solved in one step. I can think of possibly there are some solutions that would involve restructuring lots of education and like a lot of things, kind of like radical, but I think it comes down to placing the burden of education and the burden of trust upon the student. If the student wants to be able to fulfill the course requirements, I'm hesitant to say succeed, but if the student wants to learn, they're going to learn. The question then just becomes how do you find what the student wants to learn? How do you find what motivates the individual person? Um, I, I think that uh, students being forced to take certain subjects, core subjects, I think there's a lot of stuff on, uh, there's a lot of reasons on both sides for whether those should be a thing that, a thing that students have to do well in, or if that's something that a student could just not do, because like m maybe you're just not into something like global perspectives, uh, and you, you might want to use that GCSE to take some, to take some other subject that you really wanted to do, but uh, but you had to ditch that because uh, because you only get a certain amount of choices. So I think uh, students should be able to sort of have more control over what they're gonna learn, and yeah. Yes, just down here. Mine was entirely parental. My parents are both teachers and educators, so I don't, yeah, it just sort of happened. <laughs> uh, let's say like a few years ago, uh, when I was, before I was choosing my GCSEs, uh, I was really confused. I was like, what do I choose? There's so much out there. What are my options? What do I enjoy? Well, we had this small course for a few days, I would say. I can't remember when, I think year eight, uh, where we had to choose some subjects. It's kind of like you focus on this for a whole week or something. Uh, I chose engineering, electro electrical engineering. I really enjoyed it, but then I did some more research uh, before I was choosing the GCSEs, and then I thought this is not fitting for me, so I chose something similar to it. So in the end, I ended up with computer science and programming. Uh, turns out I really liked it, and additionally, I played games a lot, I still do. Um, and yeah, that boosted my, how do I say it, my passion for computers. Well, I'm a very passionate person. I'm passionate about almost everything and anything. Well, you see, well, passion starts from you. Like, maybe someone inspired you, but it will only start from you. But it can also die out. Like, I was actually, in primary school, I was very passionate about math. It was, I found it really fun in primary school because they made it seem fun. And then slowly, when you get older, it kind of dies down because like, everybody is just really tired all the time because you have so many things to do. And then you kind of just lose all that passion. But something that really just helps me open my eyes and just feel that rush of passion again, like I used to do, was, is art. I might have said before, I'm a firm believer that art is amazing. And it's something that, you know, you might not, have, you might not like it, that's fine, but 
It's also like you might not like math, but that's some, somehow a really bad thing. So I'm going to say this again. Why, why is it bad to be bad at science and math, but OK to be bad at art? OK, for me, it sounds ridiculously nerdy, but like. I think most of my the passion for the things that I learn, I think it comes from like movies and fiction and stuff. So if I see an interesting topic touched on in a movie, then I'll go home and research about that. So that's how I learn stuff. Cool. Yeah, so I think uh, I'm quite passionate about a few subjects and a bit more lukewarm on some others. And I can see like some, a couple of, like, I can see my computer science teacher is at the back of this room, so I'm not allowed to say anything bad about that. <laughs> Mr. Brown. Hey, Mr. Brown. Uh, uh, but, yeah, I think... Uh, I think uh, a lot of the time I, uh, I learn about subjects in sort of short bursts really quickly, like... Um, for example, I learned a lot of what I did, uh, what I know in computer science from like doing like little programs that I, I build at home. Like uh, at one point, I decided I wanted to make a dungeon crawler, so I'd need to learn a bit. I I'd need to do a bit more research to sort of understand procedural generation of, and al just generally algorithms on maze building for example so then i needed to learn about recursion and so on and eventually i sort of accumulated a bunch of skills that can be applied to computer science for example or uh or for math sometimes i uh sometimes i see a uh something and i'm and i think okay so how how does this work is is there a pattern to this so i might i might go out of my way to look for the maths i might need to figure something out yeah. Can I say one more thing? So uh, something came to me while I was listening to Sai that reminded me of something that might be partially more relevant. Um, I remember like my primary experience playing a huge role in my like desire to learn, and there there are two things in particular that are standing out to me as probably being pretty helpful. One, all I did in primary was just try new things which is an interesting concept, but essentially it just involved a lot of I'm forgetting how to word for the moment. Just try, look, try new things, just take it from that. And then the other thing I remember particularly strong was uh, just reading, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of reading. So that's probably not a particularly new insight to any elementary school teachers, but uh, just read a lot of books. I want to kind of expand on that a little bit, just to, to come back to where we were talking about before. Again, 2018, we were talking about before that, um, and, and we were asked to take that in the perspective of your peers. You know, you guys are pretty passionate and you're, you're pretty successful and that sort of stuff. So you were saying before that there are some subjects that are a bit boring, that you're not enjoying as much, but you, you still get through them. But some of your peers aren't. They're not, they're not necessarily getting through them. They're getting turned off. They're not achieving that sort of stuff. Now, I guess if you look at some of the social media and some of the clever engineers out there that are looking at data and looking at artificial intelligence and finding ways to make sure you go back to websites, be it likes, be it, you know, bits and pieces, they, they are, they're making very, very clever ways to get you to go back to content that sometimes isn't all that exciting. So do you think that there's something missing? Again, to this topic, is this something that you think that you should be able to access online in a digital form that is missing out there. Because we were talked before about the resources and it was really coming back to things like, yeah, we can watch teachers online being videoed. But as the lady said down there before, there's a lot more exciting things out there. So is there something that you think is actually missing that you should be able to access at school at the moment? Something that always helps me to learn better are notes. And I understand that if you weren't there for the lesson, you actually can't take notes. And you also might not really understand what's going on, so you don't know how to take the notes. So something I think would really help out is like just some 
important notes on online. You don't even need to video anybody. So if you're like worried about that, that's fine. Just, just some notes online so then people that are struggling or missed a lesson, they can look and, and which will really help um, our learning. Anything else? Anybody else want to just... Because, you know, obviously there's vendors out there that are saying they've got a successful product that is going to work for you. And I'm just wondering, you know, whether you guys have found some things or, or looked at some things. That's what I'm kind of trying to get out of here. I think regarding Sai's point about accessible notes on the internet, I think it would be really... An, I think one of the best things that people can do is sort of pull your notes when, you, when you're uh, with your classmates. Like, for example, I know it was really helpful when I was doing my English GCSEs that uh, me and the rest of the English class, we sort of had this massive spreadsheet with like 50 columns and, and we would... And, uh, so we could easily remember quotes from books. We could look at short analyses that people had put down on there, and generally it was a massive help. And I think that if uh, if teachers encourage students to sort of build these support networks for each other, so that everyone, so that every, so that so that people who's that people who aren't as into note taking can also benefit as well, and so that people who've got different perspectives uh, can help each other out. I think that would be a really good idea. Yes, do you want to shout it out? Don't go off into tangents. <laughs> Something that happens in almost every lesson, a teacher just finds something that, I don't know why, interests them more than our education and <laughs> talks about random stuff that really nobody wants to learn. I, I don't know. I think the tangents are pretty fun. Like, <laughs> like... Like, uh, like one of my classes, we've actually got bingo sheets that we just fill in after the class so that when the, te so when the teachers have gone on a tangent, we can just take it down. Like, oh, they mentioned Trump. There you go. Global warming. Yeah. China. Um, yeah. the, the thing about that is that I think it also helps th uh, develop, like, student-teacher bonds. So uh, we'll, go, we'll go with the example for the bingo sheet. That actually makes students pay attention more in a lesson where students normally fall asleep. So, yeah, there's some pros to going off on tangents, but like maybe not so much. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think if I had to teach, uh, if uh, I think I definitely put more emphasis on less teaching to the exam, but like. Uh, Certain subjects, I think, would benefit from a less structured uh, w way of teaching. Like, f uh, and also, I'd say for tests, I instead of downloading like a worksheet off of some exams website or something, it would be uh, it would be better if teachers sort of thought thought of new and inventive ways to test our knowledge. Also, another thing that I'd like to stress is focusing less on stuff like scores and mark schemes, and instead on, uh, and instead on what like what sort of uh, n again what sort of knowledge the students displaying there. Like, if 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 a work if a test that you've set it's like list uh, if if it wants the student to list something or to write their opinion. If it doesn't quite match the mark scheme, but it really go, it, but it works with the intent of the question, that uh, then uh, mark scheme and uh, then mark scheme and exam-based learning might uh, might actively hold students back. I had a teacher who at one point split the classroom into different groups based upon everyone's preferred learning style that he had just sort of slowly learned by personally interacting with each student and developing a connection. That class is probably like the best learning experience I've had in like 12 years. And so if I were to bestow upon teachers a single skill, it would be the level of 
interpersonal relationship and classroom management that enables that kind of personalized learning to happen. Yes, I'm here. Um, maybe in the morning, since everybody is kind of tired, we could do art, because art really opens your eyes and makes you really interested for the rest of the day. And then, since your eyes are already opened, we could do a science experiment, because who doesn't want to, um, after experiencing something so creative, we could really look into the science of something else. And the, I feel like the best way to learn science is through experiments, because I feel like I've learned a lot every time we have an experiment during class. And then the next lesson could be language-based. Um, for me, when I was doing French in year eight, I, don't, I took Chinese, um, we would play games, so then we could really understand what the words we were learning meant. So wait, I need three more subjects. Uh, and then afterwards, we could go and do some PE because I feel like physical education is very important for a day for a person's life, and it also releases lots of um, um, hormones, which are good for growing children. And then we could, you know. Since we've already gone through so many different aspects, we could go and do some more um, academic-based stuff, like geography or history. Because then you've already, your eyes are more open as the day ends, and then you can, so you can concentrate really well. Anyone else want to add to that? Just again, a positive aspect of describing that uh, fantastic lesson. Um, well, I think uh, it's interesting that you say like a, a wonderful day, a six day rotation, because I think a perfect day of learning would actually throw out this, the rotation of different classes and instead focus on like maybe doing one large project over the entire t day that incorporates different subjects, like f to get to use the example that I gave earlier of the dungeon crawler, I think uh, that could be interesting because it's got aspects of all sorts of things like you're going to need maths to do like uh, you're going to need maths like quadratic equations and stuff to do the to do the leveling formulas and balancing things you're going to need programming of course and and also you're going to need stuff like the arts for graphics you might want uh, you might want to take uh, you might even want to incorporate languages if uh, uh, if uh, for different characters to speak different languages, maybe there's just so much uh, potential if you're uh, for inter for inter subject uh, connections to be made. If you if you uh, stop separating the subjects so much and create a less structured mixed lesson for maybe a couple of days. Okay, we're coming down to the final five minutes. Thanks for that, Aaron. It was a good, good positive question. And I'd like to do the same, try to keep it uh, really positive to end on. And as I said, we're, we're all educators in here. Um, we're all kind of interested in what we can take away to use in a classroom to make it better for the, the students in our charge. So you've kind of hit upon a few things as we've gone through there. You've hit upon the idea that, um, you know, teachers that make that interpersonal connection. That, that's a strong thing. That's something you rate very, very highly in teaching. And I think there was a lot of nods and a lot of agreements there. But I'd like you all, if, if you wouldn't mind, to perhaps leave us with any other positive comments you can think of. Those teachers, you know, you're the people who sit in front of teachers day in, day out. You observe good ones, you observe maybe, some, look at the schools you're at, you probably don't observe any bad ones. Um, but, uh, but I'd like you just to, uh, to reflect on 
anything else, any other messages, anything else you can pass on to us of a positive nature where you can say, yeah, not only the interpersonal connection, but I like teachers who do this, X, Y, or Z. Two or three things, doesn't have to be one, it's up to you. Okay, Seth, take us off. Don't be too serious. Like, for all of our ranting about how like teachers need to stay on focus and whatever, teachers who can talk to you like, you know, not like a high schooler, don't do that, but like, just interact friendly way that's not serious 100% of the time goes miles towards just having a student actually pay attention to the class. Uh, yeah, so don't be too serious. Crack some jokes if you have to. Keep your students, uh, you know, awake. Um, and as well as do many more practicals. I'm not sure if this applies to every school, but practicals are uh, the dream, right? because you learn much more from practicals than actually writing down on your notes. Uh, you, you know, practicals are much more useful in real life, I'm assuming. <laughs> and uh, books, not so much. They can teach you the concepts and theories, but then mm, practicals, they allow you to try it out for yourself and give yourself a shot at... Damien, there's a lot of different uh, curricula here represented in the room, and I think a few people might be going, exactly what do you mean by a practical? I think. You might have a science teacher thinking, yeah, okay, I know what that is. That's kind of an experiment class. But <laughs> is that what you're talking... Can you just give us a little bit more about practicals? Uh, yeah, so, again, science, practicals is doing experiments. Uh, if you're doing, let's say, computer science, programming, it's much more fun than learning uh, basic concepts. But it also teaches two things than one. You get to learn how to do it, and you learn the theory while you're at it. Try and try and get students to have their hands on things, make something, create, be be involved in it. Right. Okay. Um, I think that we should we, you should be more mixed. Like nobody wants to only um, do very only do experiments every single lesson, and nobody wants to only write tons of essays. People want to like have a mix. So maybe some days you could. Um, you could you could do an essay and another day you could like I don't know play some games like in computer science it could be a creative lesson where we created a game or in art you you can make a piece anything which it could be anything at all and basically you um, kind of want to keep in the middle level not too high and not too low uh, for me I think uh, teachers should be flexible. So in all the best classes, I think a, te uh, a student's just gone like, hey, what about this? And asked a good question. And the teacher said, okay, let's learn about this today. And then we've learned a whole entire new topic. And that has kept the class really fun while we're still learning. Um, I think uh, teach. I think teachers should be yeah more flexible, but not in what they're teaching and more their teaching style. Like teachers, I think it would be great if teachers could try new things with teaching styles and see what works with different classes. Because like I think a lot a lot of people have that kind of story where they've got like one teacher who teaches. Uh, who teaches a subject in a certain way and it really sort of meshes with the class well some other teachers can uh, some other teachers the class just d don't really get it and it's not because of the teacher themselves it's just that some uh, that y y some subjects need certain t it need some classes need different teaching styles than other classes Fantastic. Look, I'll remind you again, our wonderful panel who've been very open, very sharing and uh, very willing to contribute today is uh, Seth Forrester from Hong Kong International School, Damien Fung from West Island School, Sai Surrey from West Island School, Patsy Ung from West Island School and Martin Lee Patterson from West Island School. I'd like you to join me in uh, giving them a heartfelt thank you for their time and their very honest and open answers.